Hello there! In today's video we are going to be looking at gravity. Now the uh, main thing I want to get out of this uh, is to go a little bit beyond what you've done uh, so far in your school career and to start to look at some of the more formal definitions of what gravity is, how it works and some of the equations that are beyond it. Uh, we're also going to be exposing a number of lies that we've taught you throughout the years uh, where we've simplified things in the past to make it uh, a little bit easier for you to understand and now we're going to teach you the, the kind of true uh, equations that we use and also explain a little bit about how they fit in with some other branches of physics. Uh, later on, uh, once you've studied a bit more simple harmonic motion on the other side of the course, you might also want to come back to this video because I will briefly touch on simple harmonic motion uh, and how we can use that in gravity as well. Okay, so let's kick off with a little reminder. Gravity is an example of a field. We are dealing all with gravitational fields in this topic, so it's worth just reminding ourselves what that means. So a, a field is a region of space where something experiences a force. Uh, and at A-level physics, there are two main uh, fields that you are probably going to be worrying about. The first is an electric field. That is a region of space where charged particles experience a force. And we're going to be dealing today with gravitational fields. Gravitational fields are a region of space where mass experiences a force. Um, we also deal with magnetic fields, which are regions of space where a uh, magnetically uh, magnetic object experiences a force. Um, and there are other fields as well that we'll get into maybe a little bit when we do some of the waves and nucle sorry, the, uh, nuclear topic, uh, where we might look at the weak interaction and the strong force uh, and how those are related to associated fields as well. But obviously for today's stuff, what we are most interested in is these gravitational fields. So it's a region of space, that means it's, a, it's a located as a vector, um, and it is where mass, so any object that has mass, experiences a force. So straight away you can think that, for example, a photon, which is a massless particle, doesn't experience the gravitational force, but every other particle in our particle zoo does, because they all have mass. Uh, you might have heard of the Higgs boson. So the Higgs boson is the exchange particle that we believe causes mass. It's different to what actually causes gravity. So a couple of people get confused sometimes um, that they read about the Higgs and they think that the Higgs is what causes gravity. It isn't. The Higgs uh, particle in the Higgs field is to do with the intrinsic property of having mass, whereas gravitational field affects things that have mass. So just a little side note there, um, especially if you're going for university interviews, um, don't get gravity and the Higgs confused. Make sure you, you know the difference between them if you're going to go down that route. Okay, so gravity is a really interesting thing to think about because um, for a long time people didn't really think of gravity as a force. Um, the force that we deal with most day to day is the electromagnetic force. The electromagnetic force is what makes things uh, move when you touch them. So if I want to throw my pen at the camera, uh, I'm going to use the fact that if you think about here's my finger uh, and here's my pen, I know they look identical, but believe me, one's different. Um, if you think about my finger, I've got negative electrons whizzing around the outside of the atoms in my finger, and there are negative electrons in the pen. So those will mutually repel each other, and that's how I can hold the pen, yeah, because I'm getting repulsion from the electrons in my finger, from the electrons in my pen. Um, but gravity is a little bit different. For a long time, people just thought of gravity as things drop. Yeah, they thought that it's the tendency of things to head downwards. Um, and a really interesting thing, if you read some of the uh, flat earth uh, logic, um, one of the things that flat earthers will say to account for the fact that things have to drop, um, well, there's, there's two things that they'll say. One is that the, they believe that the earth is constantly accelerating upwards, um, which does make a sort of sense. Um, if you imagine that uh, rather than the fact that when I let go of my pen, um, rather than the idea that my pen is being accelerated towards the Earth. They believe that the Earth is constantly accelerating upwards, um, and so when you let go of it, uh, the pen is no longer attached to the Earth, so it kind of accelerates downwards, which is 
wrong, obviously, for a number of reasons, but not the worst idea. And the other thing that you'll often see, if you ask a child to draw the Earth, and you tell them, you know, here's the countries, and you say which way is down, something that's really interesting is they'll still draw down like that. Um, and that's how you get those questions like, how do people in Australia not fall off because everything's upside down? Um, and again, that's not crazy to think like that, um, because it does kind of make a logical sense. In our in our day-to-day -day life, we only ever think of gravity as what makes stuff go down. Um, so the idea that what we know the truth is, is that gravity acts towards the centre of the Earth, which I'm sure if you're watching this video you already knew, um, that's not actually immediately intuitively obvious, um, because what we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis is uh, a much smaller region. We're only dealing with here, and if we're looking at this green area that I've just drawn, well, those arrows are all just pointing down towards the ground. Um, but there are a couple of things that we do know. So we know it pulls down. And actually, if we want to be a bit more accurate, we can say that gravity pulls towards the centre of mass. And again, we actually demonstrate this really often. For one thing, um, again, taking my pen, if I hold it at this end and let go, it falls that way because the centre of mass is here, so I can draw the weight of the pen, the force of gravity, as acting through the centre of mass of the pen. I also know that if this is my Earth, here's the centre of mass, and that's the point to which all of my gravitational field lines act. Um, and this might be important later in your exam, but you might sometimes be asked that. So you want the idea that gravity acts towards the centre of a mass of an object. I also know that the, the strength of the force of gravity is directly related to the mass. There's a couple of reasons for that. Um, for one thing, if you think about uh, astronauts bouncing around on the moon, the moon is less massive than the Earth, and so they're pulled towards it less and they bounce around less. But even more intuitively, um, if you get a water bottle, an uh, empty water bottle like this one feels light. There's not a lot of force pulling it down towards Earth. But when you increase its mass and make it heavier, you feel more force. You feel a greater force pulling it down. So we know that uh, gravity is also related to the mass of the objects. And we know that the further away you go, the lower the force of gravity gets. Now again, this one's a little bit less obvious because it's not something that we can directly observe. If you go to the top of Mount Everest, you don't actually feel any lighter. Um, and one of the exercises we'll do in class is work out how much lighter are you on Everest compared to the Mariana Trench. Um, and it works out as a very small percentage of your overall body mass. You don't really notice a difference in weight. However, we can see really easily that there is an effect of uh, distance because you don't at any point in your life go, oh, the moon's over there and get dragged towards the moon. We know the moon has gravity. We know the moon has a relatively strong force of gravity because it's what causes tides, but you don't get attracted to the moon. Same thing with the sun. You don't feel where the sun is in the day because it's very, very far away. The sun's way more massive than the moon, um, but because it's so much further than the moon, its force on us is a lot less despite that large mass. So one of the things that we know from that is that distance plays, that, plays a part um, in the strength of gravity. So let's talk about my new feature that I'm going to have on uh, these videos, which is lies we've told you in the past. So a really classic one is the idea of weight. If you go into, I think even in year seven, do I teach it in year seven? I think I do teach, in fact I do teach it in year seven. Um, in year seven we will teach you that weight is equal to mass times gravity, where gravity is 10 newtons per kilogram. I uh, will also tell you uh, at A level, uh, the strength of gravity is 9.81 newtons per kilogram. Um, but that causes an awful lot of problems. Um, for instance, so here's my object, and this is the classic thing you do in a kinematics problem, you just draw it like that. Well, we've got some issues with that. Firstly, how does weight know to act down. We're back to this previous problem that the flat earthers have of why is down down. Uh, and secondly, it almost requires uh, gravity to be sentient. It kind of has to know how much stuff there is. Now there are ways around that, um, but it's a bit of a problem. So 
This was uh, the problem that Newton had. Now, Isaac Newton famously, uh, an apple fell from a tree, and Newton wondered, well, why does the apple fall down? Why does the apple go towards the earth? Now, he'd already come up with the equation, force is equal to mass times acceleration. So the logical jump that he made was, well, what about this? What if the apple is attracted to Earth as a force between the Earth and the apple? But what if the Earth is also attracted to the apple with an equal force? Now, the mass of the Earth is approximately 6 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. The mass of an apple is approximately 0 0.1 kilograms. So if we think about this in terms of acceleration, acceleration is force divided by mass. Now what we can say is, well let's imagine that the force on an apple is about 1 newton due to gravity. Um, I think it's really, really beautiful that gravity, uh, that Isaac Newton was famously uh, came up with this because of an apple and the weight of an average apple is about one Newton. It's just poetic. Um, anyway, so that means that the acceleration of each object is one divided by their mass. So one over six times 10 to 24 is vanishingly tiny. One divided by 0 0.1 is approximately 10 meters per second squared. So what we find is that actually when an apple falls from a tree, the Earth does accelerate up to meet it. They both move together. However, the, because the, the mass of the Earth is huge, this is the Earth, the mass is huge, this is my tiny little apple, so my apple accelerates towards it much more. But the Earth does actually move very, very slightly. Um, so because he'd already come up with F is MA, probably that was a little bit str more straightforward for Newton to, to come up with than might otherwise have been thought of. Um, but what he came up with is Newton's law of gravitation. And it's, this is a fundamental building block that we're going to work on for this topic. So he defined a couple of things. He said there's a force between the objects, um, and then we need the masses of each one. It depends on those two. And it also depends on the distance between them. So he came up with the equation force is equal to mass of object 1 multiplied by mass of object 2 divided by the square of the distance between them. Now, if you think about that very quickly, you'll see that this can't possibly be right, because if I have a one kilo object and a one kilo object one newton apart, that would be one times one divided by one squared, which is one newton. And I definitely don't feel a newton of attraction towards everything. So he also came up with this gravitational constant, g. Now, the gravitational constant, g, is vanishingly small. Uh, it is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 newtons per meter, sorry, newton meter squares per kilogram squared. That's a vanishingly small constant. And that's one of the things I just need to warn you about when you're doing this topic. Uh, we deal with very large numbers and very small numbers. Generally, when we're dealing with the masses of planets, that's a huge number. When we're dealing with the gravitational constant, it's very small. So do make sure that you're confident using standard form on your calculators and interpreting standard form answers. But this is the fundamental equation that links uh, the mass of things and their distances to gravity. And it does work. We've proven this time and time again. And I'm going to talk in a little bit about how. Now, one thing that you might be interested in is why is it 1 over r squared? And it kind of makes sense when you think about the idea of spreading a force out over a distance or spreading a field out over a distance. So remember, we think of a field as the region that experiences the force. So if I call this distance r and this distance also r, you can see that for one r of distance, my field is spread out over an area that I'm going to just call 1. If I double my distance, then what I find is that I now have four times as many regions. So that's how I get the r squared value. Yeah, if I double the distance, I get four times the I get the full spread out over four times as much space, so it's four times lower. So it's a one over r squared relation rather than a one over r relation. Cool little side note on how we actually calculated g. Um, you would 
nowadays when we know what the mass of the Earth is, it's really simple. We just find out how much something weighs and plugs it into the equation. But when they first came up with this equation, they had no way of knowing the mass of the Earth. They actually uh, estimated it pretty well um, by working out the radius of the Earth from some Pythagorean stuff that had been known since the ancient Greeks. Um, and then they assumed that the Earth was roughly the same density of water and then just used a density equation. They actually got a pretty good value for it. Um, but to confirm that, they wanted to find the gravitational constant. And the way they did that was awesome. What they used is the idea of something called a torsion balance. So what it was, was basically a spring, a really, really long, really weak spring. Now we know that if I have a spring like this and I extend it downwards, it'll bounce up and down. The cool thing about a spring is not only will it bounce up and down if you do that, it will also bounce or rotate round and round if you twist it. So they twisted a spring. Now what you find is if you have a really, really long, weak spring and you twist it, it requires a vanishingly small force to actually twist. So what they could do is they could get a really, really tiny spring constant. And they found the spring constant using simple harmonic motion. So one of the experiments you're going to do on the other side of your course um, is you're going to bounce things up and down on a spring and then use some equations to calculate spring constant. Come and talk to me when you've done that because I can then talk to you about how what they did with this torsion balance was they had a bar like this attached into a spring and they displaced it slightly and started it to rotate like that. So that's the bar it was doing this, rotating backwards and forwards, and that gave them k. So k would be approximately 0 0.001 uh, newtons per meter, probably even smaller than that. And then what they could do is they brought these two bar, these two balls on the end of a bar close to very, very heavy masses. Um, so these, I think in the original one, were about 136 kilograms. So really, really big objects. Uh, and I think these ones were about 8 kilograms. And what they found was by varying the distance between them, they would just get this bar to rotate slightly. And as the, the bar rotated, um, it uh, by using this equation where we know that force is equal to k times distance moved, because that's a general equation for springs, they could actually calculate the force of it. And then from that force, if they knew this, if they could work out the magnitude of the force, they then knew the masses, they knew the distance, and they can plug it into force is equal to g m1 m2 over r squared. Pretty cool. Okay, so let's think a little bit more now about different types of fields. So one of the things that we know is that we've said that gravity always acts towards the centre of mass of an object. And that's absolutely true, and it makes total sense when you think about the Earth from a far distance. Um, it can get a little bit more confusing when you think about, well, why does, Earth, why does things seem to just fall straight down then? Um, and the simple reason is just to keep imagining that I zoom in on a very small part of the Earth. If I zoom in on a very small part of the Earth, then gravity then begins to act as a uniform field. Because if you think, I've got infinite extra field lines going in here. And if I zoom in close enough, they will appear to become parallel. Um, so one of the things you'll have to do in your exam is be very, very careful about what you're dealing with. Physics often likes to generalise things. So if we're dealing with something on Earth, say in a lab or in a room or even up a mountain, we're probably going to be dealing with a uniform field. If you're dealing with things orbiting or things in space between uh, planets, then you'll be using the radial field equations. So don't feel that just because you've learned this, now whenever you have, you know, there's a book on a table, calculate the weight of it, don't feel you have to use the full equation. Um, you can still use weight is equal to mg if we're dealing with something that's on a small enough scale, close enough to the the um, Earth's surface to be a uniform field. Okay, so now let's go on and think about gravitational field strength. Uh, so gravitational field strength can be defined as the force of gravity per unit mass. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, um, that's the g that we use day to day. So we normally think of g on Earth as being 10 newtons Per kilogram. So how do we get that 10 newtons per kilogram? Let's do a little uh, practice. We know that the force of gravity is equal to the gravitational constant times m1 times m2 divided by 
r squared. Now, um, you should have seen earlier what these constants are, so let's just substitute in for Earth. So imagine that I'm standing on Earth, and I want to know what is g. Well, I know that, remember what I said was that uh, gravity always acts from the centre of mass, so I want to know my distance from the centre of the Earth. In other words, I want to know the radius of the Earth, and that is 6.4 6.4 times 10 to the 6 meters. I also need to know the mass of the Earth, and the mass of the Earth is uh, 6.0 uh, times 10 to the 24 kilograms. And I need to know that the gravitational constant of the universe is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. Uh, units, can I remember the units? Uh, Newton meters squared per kilogram squared. Okay, so I want to know it per unit mass. In other words, I want to have the force per kilogram or force divided by my mass, m2, the mass of my test object. So that means that I'm going to get. Uh, I can just say that the little g is equal to g mass of my planet or mass of my big object divided by just r squared. So I actually already know everything I need to put in here. So just substituting these numbers, I can say that g on Earth is equal to uh, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 uh, multiplied by the mass of the Earth, which is 6.0 times 10 to the 24 all divided by the radius of the Earth squared. Don't forget to square it. If you find yourself in any of these units getting uh, wildly too massive answers, the chances are uh, you have forgotten to square something. Um, so I'm just plugging that all into my calculator now. And when I do that, I get 9.77 times 10 Sorry, no, I don't know. I just get 9.77. I'm so used to dealing with uh, large or small numbers that I just do it automatically now. Um, and that will be newtons per kilogram. So you can see we're a little bit different to the 10 or 9.81 that we usually use. And the difference for that is just because of rounding errors uh, in our values for the mass of the Earth um, and the gravitational constant and its radius. But what we find is if you go around the world and you measure it, uh, you do get roughly 9.81. Um, obviously, you're at the top of a, a mountain then this R becomes bigger. So at the top of a mountain, gravity is very slightly weaker. Um, and if you're close to something very heavy or something very dense, then what happens is the centre of mass of the Earth actually moves a little bit towards you, and you will find there are slight changes there as well. So that's why there is some variability. Um, obviously, you might be asked in your exam to calculate G for other planets, in which case you substitute in the correct radius and the correct mass for those. Okay, so in this part of the video, um, I'm going to tell to you about some more lies that you've been told. So, you probably remember this equation, uh, GPE is MGH, or it might you might have known it as MG delta H. So we often say that the gravitational potential energy of something is its mass times the strength of gravity multiplied by the height that it is at. Now that, again, remember when I was talking to you uh, in the previous section about fields, that's fine if we're treating gravity as a uniform field. However, if you imagine the uh, more generalised case of an actual planet, um, and we want to know if I go from here to here, how much energy will that take, um, this equation won't cut it. And the reason it won't cut it is because the actual equation for work done is an integral. It's an integral from the start position to the end position of the force acting on that object with respect to its position. Um, and that's the, the, the most basic form of it. So when you do something like uh, pushing a brook along a table, so I have a force there, what we're actually saying is if I move it between there and there, I move it distance x, so I can say that the work done is equal to the integral between zero position and my final position of a constant force with respect to x. And that just becomes fx 
between 0 and x, so it just becomes fx. Um, so that, again, if you think about that in terms of gravity, if I'm lifting an object up from one height to a new height, so I'm moving it to there, um, then again this equation works in a uniform field because what we would say is the work done is the integral of uh, mass times gravity uh, with respect to height and I'm not going to bother expanding it I'm sure you can see that, that is mgh however that requires in both these cases for the force to be constant as we've discovered previously, we now know that the force is actually equal to g m1 m2 over r squared. Now, when we're moving from one distance to another, we're actually moving through a change in distance. So we can't use this simplified form. This simplified form mgh only works when the strength of gravity or the force of gravity is a constant. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to have to use this full form and plug it into an equation. Now, if you don't take A-level maths, you probably won't know how to do this equation. So you don't actually need to know it. All you need to know is the answer. But it's nice to see where it comes from. So what we're going to say is that the work done in moving something is equal to the integral of g m1 m2 over r squared with respect to r. And we're going from our start position to our end position. In fact, no, I'm not going to put. In fact, I'm not going to put the limits of, of integration in that, actually, because I'll talk to you about that in a minute. So, simplifying that, we just get. Uh, well, not simplifying it, but just making it in a, a term that's a bit easier. I'm going to say r to the negative one dr. And if you remember, the general way that we integrate something is to add one to the power and then multiply it by the new power for nice simple integration. So it becomes g m1 m2 r to the negative 1 and I multiply that whole equation by negative 1 so that becomes minus g m1 m2 over r that is my gravitational potential energy so now I know how to find the gravitational potential energy of an object using this equation and like I said you can totally still use this form if you're dealing with a uniform field like this. So here you would use work done is mg delta h. But if you're dealing with something where you're getting far enough away that it becomes radial, then you need to use the idea that work done is minus g m1 m2 over r. So always look at your context. Okay, so you may be asked to find gravitational potential. Gravitational potential is the work done to move a one kilogram test mass or a one kilogram object from an infinite distance to a point. Um, so what it tells us is how much energy do I need basically to get into deep space? How do I need to how much energy do I need to escape Earth's gravity? Um, so let's say that I've let's try and calculate that on Earth. Um, so we let's say phi, which is gravitational potential, that is equal to negative g m over r. So if I have a one kilogram object, how much energy do I need? Well, similar to what I did earlier, I'll just substitute my numbers. Uh, so g is negative six point six seven times ten to the negative eleven. Uh, multiplied by the mass of Earth, which is 6.0 times 10 to the 24. Excuse my uh, poor formatting on the side there. And I need to divide that by 6.4 times 10 to the 6. And when I plug that into a calculator, I get... Come on, don't complain. Uh, minus 62 megajoules. So what that tells me is that if I go from infinity, from an infinite distance, to Earth, I will lose 62 megajoules for every kilogram I go. Um, 
and the, so this is often people get confused about this minus sign and the reason from it is that gravitational potential is defined as moving an object from an infinite distance to a point so if you think about this as the earth what i'm saying is i'm taking it from all the way over there to infinity and i'm going do, 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 to that point now as we know if i'm going towards the center of mass of an object things increase it it loses energy as it goes there so that's why it's negative because i'm doing negative work on the object the object's actually having work done on it by moving from to that position um, so that's why it's negative. It also tells me I can go the other way, I just change the sign. So if I want to go from the surface of the Earth to an infinite distance, I need 62 megajoules of energy per kilogram of stuff. Which is why you can start to see why rocket launches are so expensive. You need huge amounts of fuel because you have to get a huge amount of energy into an object to give it enough gravitational potential to escape. So then we'll talk a little bit more about why we start at zero for gravitational potential energy. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for it. First of all, if you imagine the Earth, well, let's say that I want to measure from there. So I'm going to call the surface of the Earth zero energy. What happens if you go down in a mine? If you dropped in a mine, you would still be going down, so you'd be losing energy. So in our day-to-day -day life, we often think about, okay, here's my rocket ship, and it's going off, and you think, well, how much energy do I need to give it? And that does make sense um, until you think about the fact that, well, what about if I go to, if I start my rocket at this point? So let's say if I start my rocket from orbit, how much energy do I need to give it? Suddenly it starts to get a bit more complicated. Um, and when you think about the fact that, well, what about if my launch site is below sea level and I'm launching from there, um, there's, it's very difficult to come up with a position that we say is zero energy, particularly if you then start going to other planets. If I go to a different planet, it will have different gravitational potentials. Um, so again, it'll be very difficult. So at an infinite distance, if we say that you just keep traveling until you are far enough away that... Uh, when we're dealing with the potential, so we're saying phi is equal to negative gm over r. If we're saying r is approximately infinity, then we can say that phi is approximately zero. Um, so that's the only thing that makes sense. Um, if we said start r at zero, um, that means you're starting from the center of every single planet, um, which could could work. Um, but again, you're going to have problems if you go from one object to the other. And when we do some worked examples in class, you'll see why that's the case. I just want to talk very quickly about equipotentials. Um, so one of the things you may be asked to do is to draw areas of equal field strength. And again, this is just a radial field. So it's similar to what you've done with electric fields. Um, they become progressively closer together as you get closer to the center of a planet. Um, so what that means is that each of these fields, to go from one position to another, requires the same amount of energy. So you can think about if you are doing a space launch, once you're relatively far away from Earth, you don't actually need to add that much energy to increase your distance quite a lot. Um, conversely, as you go closer and closer to the Earth, um, you require more energy to move the same distance because of, again, that R squared relation. And the last thing, you may be asked to draw some graphs like this. In fact, you definitely will be asked to draw, asked to draw some graphs like this because I'm going to ask you to draw some graphs like this. Um, so this is a pretty classic example. Um, so this is gravitational field strength. Um, and I've just thrown in here a little bit of calculus um, just to give you an idea of what it uses, of what it means, but you don't actually have to, to know it. The key thing to realize is that as we get further and further from our planet, so as R increases, um, we can say that the gravitational field strength drops off. That's little g. And if you wanted to know it um, a bit more formally, we can say um, that uh, gravity is the negative differential of gravitational potential. But you really don't need to worry about that um, for, G for A level. Slightly different to that is the idea of gravitational potential. Because gravitational potential is always negative, um, it becomes more and more and more negative as we go towards the Earth, or as we go towards our object, and again follows an R-squared relation as we get further and further and further away.
Um, so just make sure you're comfortable with these graphs and that you can understand where they come from. Yeah, so G is equal to big G M over R squared. So we have a one over R squared relation uh, and gravitational potential uh, phi is equal to G M over R. Uh, sorry, negative gm over r. So you get these two slightly different curves. Um, they look a bit like a mirror of each other, but they're not a mirror um, because one is an r squared relation and one is just a straight one over r relation. Okay, so that's been a pretty uh, breakneck pace there. We will go through a lot of this in the lesson. If you do have any questions, um, then please bring them along as always and do put them in the comments to this as well. And I'll see you in class.